In autonomous racing, we are often concerned with state estimation. We want to know where the race car is in space and how it got there. Or we want to plan how to get to a goal position through a sequence of movements. To describe this, we need to understand the basics of pose representations and the coordinate transformations for rigid bodies like the F110 race car. As always, this course is a team effort with contributions from a variety of individuals. We're grateful for learning from each other. This is a very simple video that clearly showcases the concept of different frames of references. It's just different ways of looking at the same point from the agent, sensor, actuator, or the world. We'll now see how we can have different frames on our car, as well as why it is important to us. We'll cover three things today. First of all, what are coordinate frames that we usually see on autonomous vehicles and what are the transformations we need? Second, we'll look at the reference frames of our F110 vehicle and how to do rigid body transformations. And in a supplementary lecture, we'll go over the ROS TF, TF2, which are ROS specific frames and transformation packages that you will use in your code. So let's get started with frames and transformations on autonomous vehicles. On an autonomous vehicle, you can find multiple sensors on board. For example, LIDARs, radars, cameras, and sensors provide their measurement in the frame of reference specific to that sensor and that sensor only. So imagine having a LIDAR mounted on top of the vehicle. The measurement from the LIDAR gives us the distance from the obstacle to the LIDAR, but not the distance of the obstacle to the front bumper. But we probably want to know the distance between the obstacle and the front bumper. And in this case, frame transformations come handy. Similar to autonomous vehicles, we have multiple sensors on board our F110 vehicle. So the same type of transformation needs to be performed for more precise navigation within the environment around us. So let's look at popular cars like Tesla, which have multiple uh, cameras uh, from different, capturing different perspectives from the side, from the top, from the rear, uh, or Waymo, which has a mix of cameras and a lot of LIDARs. Again, these are short range LIDARs, long range LIDARs, uh, and uh, also mounted on the top of the vehicle. So we want to be able to capture all these multiple perspectives and get some form of a global perspective from the vehicle's viewpoint, not from the individual sensor's viewpoint. And other vehicles have a mix of sensors now with radar, cameras, LIDARs, uh, and as we will see, these provide you know, different uses. But from each sensor's perspective, as you can see on the left-hand side, we are able to capture you know, a stream, a sensor stream. And these streams are now processed uh, to provide, say, the RGB camera view, a depth perspective, uh, an optical flow, flow perspective to show how fast things are moving. And then we can run object detection, object tracking, semantic segmentation for a variety of safety applications. Now, these multiple views would also need to be combined to provide a bird's eye view, for example, for the vehicle so they can have 360 degrees situational awareness, be aware of where obstacles are coming from and so that they can make decisions in advance. A second reason that we need to do frame transformations on autonomous vehicles is that mapping is usually done by tying multiple maps together instead of creating one whole map all at once. The animation shown in this demo for Google Cartographer, which we will use later in the course to create maps from this SLAM algorithm, uh, for example, uses two subsystems. as a local SLAM that builds a succession of submaps as you can see here, each part inside the bounding box that I've shown is a submap of its own. And each submap is meant to be locally consistent, meaning that it has its own frame of reference and all measurements that are done in that submap have, have its own frame of reference. The second part of the system is a global SLAM whose job is to find loop closure constraints and tie together submaps to, so that we can then use uh, apply global optimization. And its job is to create consistent, a consistent global solution. As you can imagine, frame transformations come in very handy here 
because you need to figure out the transformations between the reference frame of different submaps in order to create a good global map. So now let's look at the basics of coordinate frames. A coordinate frame is simply a set of three orthogonal axes for the x, y, and z direction. And they have the origin where you place it on this frame. On the top right, you see an example of a coordinate frame that is placed at the center of the F110 car with the LiDAR in front and the camera mounted in the front as well. On the bottom right, you see a top-down view of what is the exact frame looking like with the X direction pointing in the front of the car and the Y direction, uh, Y axis pointing towards the left of the car. And the Z is coming out towards you from the top of the car. On the bottom left, you see an example of what you could call or describe as the world frame, right? So this entire map and anywhere the scar is on this map can be measured with respect to the origin at this bottom left of the world frame. So in many robotic systems, the first step is always to figure out and assign some coordinate frame that makes sense in, in the position of the robot. So let's take an example here. We have a race car R and we want to represent the position of this robot with respect to the coordinate frame W. The origin of the world frame is at the bottom left corner. So you can see that the car is located at X equals two point something and the Y is double that, so what, 4.2. So how about if you had multiple cars or if you have an obstacle in front of the car, or you could also assign a coordinate frame on top of the, your red car itself. So you have robot R1 and then you have robot R2 and you could say, what is the position or the relative position of R2 with respect to R1? So in this image, you can see roughly that R2 is located almost along the x-axis. So that's why when we have x is eight, and then in terms of the y direction, it's, it's in the negative green direction, y direction, which is why we have a slight negative uh, value of uh, 0 0.1. Any position or pose of the robot only makes sense when you have defined a coordinate frame in which you are describing that pose. The pose of the robot is a combination of the position and the orientation or the rotational aspect of the robot. So you have X, Y, and Z and theta, which fully describe where one robot is located, uh, with, either with respect to another robot in the case where you're talking about a frame of reference of robots themselves, or they are the absolute pose with respect to the world frame or the coordinate axis at the bottom left. The other reasons we need coordinate frames is to understand and relate quantities observed by the robots, say by the different sensors, as we can see in this drone, uh, and robots at different time steps as they move through the world. Some conventions that robotics and ROS in particular uses is the XYZ orthogonal axis they follow is called the right hand coordinate system, uh, where if you point your index finger and your middle finger and your thumb orthogonal to each other at 90 degree angles to each other using your right hand, then your index finger points towards the X axis. Your middle finger points towards the Y axis and your thumb points towards the Z axis. So the vehicle is always moving forward in the X axis. In ROS, the color convention is also fixed. So RGB, red, green, and blue always correspond to X, Y, and Z axis. So that's a very easy way to remember the orientation of these three axes, even when the labels are missing just by looking at the color. The left-hand coordinate system is much more prevalent in the graphic design community. Now let's understand how we can compute transformations of points across different coordinate frames. I want to introduce you to a couple of terms that we'll use often, where you'll see the term, the map frame, which is being used quite often when people talk about the world uh, and we will have lots of transformations with respect to the map frame as we move around the world. And this frame is the most intuitive and easy to understand, just like any map. The sensor frame of reference essentially means that we look at the world from the perspective of the sensor, maybe a camera or a depth sensor. Uh, that's all it sees and that's all it will tell you. It doesn't really know or care about the map or the world around it. It doesn't associate objects uh, as it sees as to where they are in this world. Or, or tell, it just tells you how far the object is with respect to the sensor alone. So it's kind of like a first person view from the sensor. Uh, 
We are responsible for making these connections between the sensor and what the sensor sees uh, and, uh, and what is placed on the map over here. So let's, let's, take, let's see how our car, for example, uh, captures this, this world view and how we can actually relate all these objects that the car is observing in and around it. So we get both a situational awareness and we are also able to navigate through this pretty cluttered space. In the car that we have, uh, we attach the sensor or the LIDAR, you know, LIDAR frame onto the LIDAR. And so this is the, the measurement frame. This gives us the distance of the objects from the LIDAR. And this of course does not return the accurate distance from the center or the front of the car. Therefore, we need to attach a frame to the body of the car that you can see at the bottom left over here. We will make all measurements with respect to the car from this frame, which is the, the vehicle's frame. The LiDAR gives us measurement readings uh, and that, that have some delta X and some delta Z offset from the front and the middle of the car. And we don't really care about the rest of the frame of the car. So the, the front of the car will then be 0, 0, 0 with respect to the car frame and some delta X, 0 for Y and delta Z for the laser frame. The position of the frame of the car is in your is your discretion. Placing it in front is just an example. Throughout this lecture, we will be using the Ross color conventions for representing the different axes, red for X, green for Y, and dark blue for Z. Note the axis of every frame of reference are orthogonal to each other. Each axis represents a dimension, and any position in space can be represented using these three dimensions. Let's look at what would happen at the world, if we look at the world, the way the LIDAR looks at the world, it doesn't make too much sense. For one, you know, we are always apparently stationary and everything else is moving around us. So we don't have this overall context as to what is beyond our local view. If you see what the car is actually doing at that time, the scenario is quite different. This is simply because we are now viewing things from the map frame. And this vehicle is just moving across a room. Let's assume this is the frame setup we have for our car. When we race, we need to know the position of the car with respect to the map frame. We will also need to convert from the laser frame to the map frame and identify location of obstacles in the map frame. So make sure you have begun to comprehend uh, what this transformation means with respect to the frames, because we'll using, be using this quite often now. So let's see over here, we have two types of transforms, static transforms between the laser frame and the car frame. Now it's a rigid body. So they are basically at a constant uh, offset from each other uh, and dynamic transforms between the map and the car frame. Now, as the car moves around, we got to keep updating the position of the vehicle relative to the map frame. So we need to continuously compute this transformation. I want to clarify the importance of the word rigid over here. Rigid simply means that we are dealing with objects that have a fixed structure. For example, you cannot apply these uh, concepts of rigid body transformation to Play-Doh or definitely not to Baymax. So our car is a rigid body. And that basically means that the two given points on the rigid body, they remain at a constant uh, separation uh, over time, regardless of the external forces. And now, even though the car may be tilting and moving across relative to the overall size of the car, those movements are quite tiny. Deformations over here, say when the car is drifting, they are small relative to the motion. The car is still coming back to its rigid form. Uh, and then we see that, you know, any kind of translations, the motion of the body is completely specified by the motion of any single point on that body. So all points on the body have the same velocity and the same acceleration. And then when we talk about rotation, all particle moves and move in circular paths about the axis of rotation. The motion of the body is completely determined by the angular velocity of rotation. So basically fixing a point on the vehicle is as good as capturing the movement and the pose of the entire vehicle. So to reiterate, why do we need to learn about coordinate frames and transformations? First of all, the data that we get from our different sensors is usually provided 
in the most convenient frame to that source, right? Whichever sensors on board, it provides its own first person view. So the second we have, once we have a map, we might want to localize ourselves on a map for a more advanced algorithm for navigation. Third, if an obstacle is detected in the laser frame, for example, maybe you want to know where that is in the world frame. And so it's much easier for the navigation task. Uh, next, we, need, we also need to know the transformation between frames of components of the car so that, so that you can drive at higher accuracy. For example, if you're driving, thinking about the motor is at the laser frame, then you have a full car lens of error in actuation. So we want to do very fast dynamic maneuvers uh, in cluttered spaces. It's important that we have the right positions uh, with respect to the car's frame. Finally, as we capture submaps in the SLAM algorithm, we want to know their location with respect to each other in a global frame. And there are many more reasons why we want to study this, but this gets us started over here. Next, we'll talk about the reference frames that you can find on your F110 vehicle and why there are multiple of them. First of all, we need to know where the robot is in the world. So it makes sense to have a, a frame representing the robot and the frame representing the world. As you can see, for example, we use a laser frame for the car and we use a map frame to represent the world. We'll see later in an example why representing the car's position in the global frame makes more sense. And also if the LIDAR sees an obstacle, we might want to know the obstacle's position in the global frame. So now let's see the different frames, but the perspectives from the different frames. So if you only look at the range measurements from the LIDAR as shown to the right, it's hard to make sense of what we are seeing. This is a car going down a straight corridor and then coming to a turn. Uh, but if we put the laser scans relative to the map and show the entire map, instead of just a local frame, the world makes much more sense now. If you only look at the range measurements from the LIDAR as shown to the right, it's hard to make sense of where we are in the world. And now we can compare both of these and I will just replay these animations once again. Next, we'll go over the specific frames that we'll be using in the F110 system. Uh, and for example, the three frames that we see in the picture here, the first one is a map representing the environment. The second is the base link representing the actuation frame of the vehicle. And the third is the laser frame, which is the measurement frame of the vehicle. The map frame represents the environment around the robot. The map frame's origin can be set arbitrary. It's up to you. Say you're starting a race, you want to set it at the starting point of the race, and you want to come back to that point after a lap. Uh, you have to set an origin uh, when you're first making the map and just keep it consistent throughout your, your navigation task. The map frame is defined by the map we use. If we are racing in this corridor, then we define it based on this map. Oh, and if you're racing outdoors, then we'd base it on some other map. And this is refer also referred to as the global frame. Then we have the base link frame that is defined as the center of the car's rear axle. And it moves with the car relative to the map frame. And it's also where the car is actuated from. It can be used to represent the car's position since it's a, it's, it's a frame fixed to the car and because the car is a rigid body, so we can pick that point. Lastly, we have the laser frame, which is the frame the laser scan measurement is taken. And it, it also moves with the car relative to the map frame. As we mentioned, the car itself is a rigid body, so we can assume that the transformation between the laser and the base link is static. So we want to link the laser frame to the base link frame, and then we want to figure out a link or a transformation between the base link frame in turn with the global map frame. We also have something called the ODOM. That's not exactly a frame. It is much more of a history describing the relationship between two frames, the base link and the map. The odometry message in ROS provides a pose estimate of the car and the pose is relative to the odometry frame. In simulation, it will be more like moving relative to the odometry frame. Next, we'll talk about how to actually perform frame transitions. For example, if we look at our earlier safety lab, when we defined only one time to collision threshold for the emergency braking, 
Uh, the distance between the wall and the car after the car is stopped is different depending on the traveling direction. Since all the scan measurements are taken in the laser frame, which is not exactly where you might want to do this calculation from. As we can see in the picture here, the laser frame is towards the front of the vehicle. This could be remedied by adding a frame in the center of the chassis, for example, and calculate the time to collision from there. So it will keep it consistent if you're going forward with the vehicle or reverse. Uh, but the distance in the front and the back of the car uh, to the frame is consistent. Next, how do we actually transform the measurements in the original frame to the new frame that we just added? So let's formalize this problem statement at hand. Let's say that we have frame A over here described in the bottom left, and we have frame B, which is a rotated version of this frame. Frame B is rotated by some theta uh, with respect to the x-axis of frame A. Now we want to express the coordinates of frame B in terms of frame A. Fine, that's simple enough, but let's get started with the basics and then we'll walk through to how we get to more interesting uh, transformations. Let's start by assuming that both the frames have the same origin. So there is no translation. We are right at the same spot. It's just that we are rotated slightly with respect to the original frame. So we deal with rotation only for now. Rotations about the origin by an angle theta can be defined as linear transformations. Consider two reference frames with the common origin O, the pre-rotation axis X and Y, and the post-rotation axis X prime and Y prime. Now consider that along with the coordinate frames, a point P is rotated to P prime in the top right we will describe how to determine the new coordinates relative to the original reference frame. Notice that P prime still has coordinates P, X, P, and P, Y relative to the post-rotation frame X prime and Y prime. Since distances do not shrink or grow when objects fix, uh, are rotated for these rigid bodies. Specifically, P prime is obtained by walking P, X units from the origin in the direction of X prime and then P Y units in the direction of Y prime. Hence to determine its coordinates in the original reference frame, we can use the fact that the coordinates of X prime and Y prime are known. Similarly, we calculate Y prime by walking P Y distance along the Y prime axis. Now using a little trigonometry, we shall see that the X uh, prime has coordinates of cosine theta and sine theta. And we have a uh, Y prime has coordinates of negative sine theta, cosine theta. We will dwell more deeply into this next. Let's look at the rotation in the form of rotation matrices. We need to represent the orientation of the axis of frame B in frame A. So X B cap, Y B cap, and Z B cap are the unit vectors of the respective axes represented using the unit vectors of axis from frame A. We use these expressions to form a rotation matrix R. This rotation matrix gives us the orientation of points in frame B with respect to frame A. Let's take a moment to absorb this piece of information. So we have two frames A and B and they're oriented as shown. B is rotated theta degrees about the Z axis of A and now let's take a look at how we can do this with the, the rotation matrix. So let's take a point P expressed in frame B. The point is at 0, 5, 0. Uh, so it only has a Y, a positive Y coordinate along the, the Y prime axis. So now we have this orientation of this point in frame A. According to the equation, let's first represent XB with respect to the axis of frame A. XB has the cosine component of XA that's marked in magenta or pink over here. So we basically take the uh, cosine theta of XA hat. And similarly, um, we see that the sine component of YA is, is, part, of, is, is, is part of XB hat. There is no Z component. Uh, what we effectively have done is we found the first column vector 
of the rotation matrix in question over here. And so now we have R11, R21, and R31 of this rotation matrix. The rotation matrix now looks like this, where we fill the first column using this equation. Notice that the axis are the unit vectors, and we left uh, on the left of the matrix. The rows of this matrix signify the axis of frame A. Similarly, we find the remaining columns of the rotation matrix over here. Now that we have R, we can represent the point P in, this, in the frame A using the given formula. Assume that theta over here, for example, is pi divided by six. And now we calculate the value of P in the frame A is this rotation matrix calculated in the intermediate step. And that turns out to be these values here uh, using cosine theta, uh, sine theta and zero for the first column, the negative uh, cosine theta and then sine theta and zero for the second column. We are able to we are able to use the rotation matrix to express the position in different frames, but notice how the origins are coincident. So, what if the origins of the two frames are not in the same locations? And we need to compensate for this displacement as well. So, rotation followed by displacement. So, let it also be at a distance d from the origin a. Note that the significance of the super and subscripts in this notation. The distance d over here has from uh, is with is fra in frame b with respect to frame a, so that's why we have a d b in the bottom. Let there be a point p as shown in this known location in in frame b, and the problem statement now is to find the representation of point p from the perspective or within frame a, as shown in this purple line, purple vector. We need a method to encode the rotation and translation of frame B with respect to frame A. Back to our original scenario, rotation alone is not enough. We must handle the translation uh, in the origin between the two frames. The translation, we need to add the displacement between the origins of the frames. So the updated formula is shown as so. And so what we have eventually done is rotate the frame and then translate it. And so now you can compensate for any rotation uh, or translation between the frames. On simplifying the previous equation, we obtain a homogeneous transformation matrix H, which combines the rotation and the translation in one matrix. This, this are the basics of rigid body transformations in robotic systems. And now we will take it further. Putting everything together to represent a point in frame two with respect to frame one, we apply the rotation and then we apply the translation. We rotate the frame uh, two to get the, a point P prime. And P prime is going to be the transformation from frame one to frame two. And the matrix is multiplied by the displacement vector P two. And then we apply the translation, which is basically we are moving the frame so that the two frames coincide with each other. And P prime is moved to the position P one that we see here. And so this combines rotation first followed by an addition of for the translation. So we have multiplication, which is nonlinear, and the addition, which is a linear. Putting everything together, now we have the rotation vector plus the translation vector from O2 to O1. And we see, uh, as we've seen before, it's kind of very complicated to write out you know, this addition in this matrix along with the multiplication. So instead of doing these two steps, we introduce this homogeneous matrix transformation as a whole that ties together these two, as I just mentioned. So the top left section of the H matrix is the rotation matrix that we found before. We have a zero matrix at the bottom and a single number one at the bottom right, most of the H matrix. Then we have the translation matrix on the top right, and this will represent the translation that ties together you know, both the rotation and the translation. We call these types of transformation H homogeneous transformations. It is a matrix representation of a rigid body transformation, as we've seen before. And for example, here R is a two by two matrix if you're doing all the transformations in 2D, and a three by three matrix if you're doing it in 3D. Um, 
The displacement vector d is a two by one in two d and three by one in three in, as a three d vector. Note that before we we see that we have padded our point vector p with a one at the bottom. This is called the homogeneous representation of a vector. We'll come back to this again later in the semester in our vision lecture. So now let's summarize poses, transformations, put them together and look at them in the context of us driving a car in this world. Positions in 2D and 3D are expressed with respect to the coordinate frames. As we can see in the vector representation, the world frame is the common global frame. A common representation of a robot state is expressed by its pose, and the pose is a combination of the position and orientation. As objects move or are observed relative to the robot, we want to express them with respect to the world frame too. So a common transformation is given a point C in robot R's coordinate frame, what is the position of the point in the world frame W? As we have seen, we use a homogeneous transform to capture this combination of rotation and translation. So now it's pretty straightforward to you. Uh, this is a, there is also a choice of notation, as you can see, for positions, rotations, poses. It's just important to be consistent as to where we have the origin frame and the destination frame. Now we discuss how to express a sequence of movements of the robot. So, so what we see here is a, a, a robot first at an angle theta, and we use the right-hand rule to see whether the angle is positive or negative. And the right-hand rule basically with the thumb pointing in the Z direction shows us that this counterclockwise movement theta is in the positive direction. And so therefore we have positive 47 degrees in this example or 0.82 radians. And, and when we capture this within the uh, rotation matrix for the sine theta from the uh, relative frame, the robot's frame to the world frame and, and sine theta, similarly a negative sine theta, cosine theta in this 2D matrix, we basically input use this angle theta to calculate the actual uh, values in this 2D matrix. So now similarly in 3D, if you're working with drones or objects moving in 3D space, we have a three by three rotation matrix. And once again, here R is an orthog orthonormal matrix. So we have X, Y, and Z as orthogonal axes. Oh. Unlike our 2D case where there was a zero transform along the Z axis, in the general 3D case, the rotation is along all three axes over here. And so in the 3D rotation is encoded as a three by three matrix whose columns are uh, give the coordinates of the rotated axis relative to the origin original axis over here. So we can see, uh, for example, the X axis is R11, R21, and R31. And that's what describes that point, that direction and the pose of the X axis. So rotations about a given axis, you know, say what we saw before was along the, you know, rotations in the 2D plane uh, in the, with, uh, with the Z axis coming out towards us, uh, the Z, the Z co coordinates over here in the matrix are essentially zero. Uh, so we have our matrix in the bottom right is what we had for the X and Y rotation. And the, in, the, in the Z direction, it was just a zero uh, coefficient. Now, if you are given a rotation from R1 to R2, we can compute the rotation from R2 back to R1 just by taking the inverse of the given rotation. And in this case, it is also equal to the transpose of the given uh, rotation matrix. So it is quite efficient to uh, calculate that. So we can also now compose a sequence of rotations by just multiplying the individual rotations. So if you have a rotation from the world to R1 and then from R1 to R2, we can multiply the individual rotations to capture the rotation from the origin to R2 directly. This works with homogeneous transformations too. So we can apply this, comp this composition and inverse transform by chaining a sequence of individual transforms as we see in the bottom left. And, uh, and we can also capture the transform in the inverse direction as we see on the right side. So rotation matrix is one way to represent rotation. In the raw standard, you also have quaternions. Uh, for a good supplemental material, we recommend uh, Steve Laval's virtual reality lectures. 
Uh, so this will be linked in a separate link in the slides. Uh, and if you're interested on how quaternions work, it's a very good introductory lecture. We also have other representations like Euler angles and axis angles. We're not going to go into the details here, but you can see as an Euler angles, you can describe the pose of, um, of, of a, a, a system just by the yaw, pitch, and roll. So these three numbers represent the rotation. Oh. So where will we use this now? So we'll use this in lab two for the automatic emergency braking, uh, we, where we want to build a safety car that does not crash into obstacles onto the wall. And we'll also use this in reactive methods in lab three for navigation and planning just within the context of the local frame. In later labs, uh, we will have map-based methods using simultaneous localization and mapping. Uh, and we will need to do these transforms in performing planning in the context of a global frame. So uh, in a supplementary lecture, we'll learn about you know, applying TF and TF2 transformations in ROS. So here are the key takeaways. I'll give you a moment to take a look at them and understand them. And this concludes our lecture over here. And uh, we'll be happy to take any questions in the comments. Thank you.